booktube today being february 1st um we are going to be talking about a book i read called uh the king of new orleans how junkyard dog became the world's first black pro wrestling superhero by greg klein that is a long title um, so this book was, it had its good points and it had its bad points. Um, one of the things that I want to say about this book that was completely worth the purchase price was that there was one little thing that is kind of one of those um, legends throughout history um, in small wrestling circles, I guess, that got put to bed on this. And I don't even know if they meant to do that. But it was just like a throwaway line. But it proved something that um, every other wrestling book I've ever read has towed the line on and i'm not going to tell you what it is because when i read it i was like blown away i couldn't believe it so um that little gem made this book worth it just for that um the next thing is is that this book is really good and obviously gray klein was a huge fan a junkyard dog so that's awesome. The part that I think it fails at is that I don't know if there's enough information about Junkyard Dog out there to warrant a book about him. Because um, Sylvester Ritter, who would eventually be named Junkyard Dog by Bill Watts, um, based off of the... Um, Bad, bad Leroy Brown song. Um, they couldn't call him Leroy Brown because there were already um, actually multiple Leroy Brown named type wrestlers around. So there's a line in the song that says <clears throat> um, something about a chain on a junkyard dog or something like that. And that's where the name came from. But anyway. Um, this book delves deep into, um, dogs heyday in Mid-South Wrestling, which was a promotion that went, um, up Louisiana into Arkansas, um, maybe another, like, bit of a state somewhere, but then Oklahoma. And, um... Bill Watts wanted to put his world title, which wasn't a world title, it was the North American title, but it was the highest title in Mid-South. Um, he wanted to put it on an African-American wrestler um, because he thought that it was time to do so. So this is like um, late 70s, like 79, 80. And he thought that... Um, especially in New Orleans, he would be able to draw really big houses if he could get um, this African-American wrestler to connect with the audience. And um, one of the crazy things about uh, Louisiana and New Orleans in particular <clears throat> is that there were a couple different places they ran shows in New Orleans. And one of them was downtown and really um, close to the bus line. And people could just, like, take the bus in um, and be dropped off basically right in front of the arena. Then there was another place on the other end of town that was generally more white um, and a little... Um, 
more upscale, I guess is the best way to put it, and kind of hard to get to if you lived in downtown New Orleans. And then they would do the big shows at the Superdome. And um, so the biggest angle that they put together was the blinding angle where Michael Hayes from the Freebirds um, blinded Junkyard Dog with some hair cream and they sold it and sold it for weeks and then it got to the point where um, Dog said that he missed witnessing his daughter being born um, because he couldn't see and he couldn't work anymore and he couldn't support his family and like hundreds and hundreds probably thousands of fans were mailing like a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars to the stations where Mid South played on to help um, keep JYD on his feet and all this other stuff. And he kept the money, but um, they didn't break kayfabe on that, <clears throat> so that was kind of cool. But they um, ended up when he finally did come back, he had a match with Michael Hayes at the Superdome, and. Um, they drew over 20,000 people, and that was the um, North American indoor attendance record until Hogan and Orndorff in Toronto. Um, and then it was just like the American indoor attendance record. And then that got squashed by WrestleMania 3. We all know how that story goes. <clears throat> anyway, so the book goes into a lot of detail about um, that angle, the angle with um, the Rat Pack, <clears throat> who was Ted DiBiase, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, and Matt Bourne, who would later be known as Doink the Clown, and um, how um, they had that Loser Leave Town match. And, um, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, they were filming at, like, some county fair, and, um, someone in a gorilla suit, who everyone thought was just part of the fair, jumped in the ring and speared Junkyard Dog, and he got pinned, and he had to disappear for 90 days. And so the next week, um, some dude shows up called Stagger Lee in a mask and a bodysuit and Ted DiBiase and everyone's like, that's Junkyard Dog, that's Junkyard Dog. And they're like, well, we can't prove it. And then Stagger Lee ends up becoming North American champion. And then he has to drop the belt when at the end of Junkyard Dog's suspension, um, Stagger Lee just disappears, but Junkyard Dog shows up. Um, and so, like, all that stuff was really good stuff. And um, a lot of people, especially people who are just familiar with WWF, Junkyard Dog, have no idea what a freaking just otherworldly icon Junkyard Dog was in Mid-South between like 80 and 84 like you couldn't hold a candle to him like nobody could it was like he was the main dude and then there was a bunch of other people and the gap between like even his feuds were good but he was junkyard dog like who the hell are these other people kind of thing Anyway, um, but it even went through the <clears throat> Butch Reed heel turn and um, the Mr. Wrestling 2 heel turn um, to the awful bump JYD took on Mr. Wrestling 2's uh, knee lift that looked totally fake and everyone in the crowd knew it and completely killed the territory um junkyard dog was a god and then he took a fall and that was the beginning of the end 
And by that point, um, his drug use was getting out of control. His body was changing a great deal. Um, but then the book goes into basically just the history of Mid-South Wrestling. Like, the majority of this book, like, the book should be called The Rise and Fall of Mid-South Wrestling. And then, like, it talks a little bit about... Um, JYD's run in WWF and his WrestleMania appearances, and then a little bit about him going back to WCW when um, Bill Watts was in charge of WCW and he wanted to make another black world champion, but have it be the actual world champion this time. Um, and it's just, it just got sad. It was just um, sad, sad, sad. And then, um, he ended up dying in a car accident that didn't have anything to do with drugs or alcohol. It was just a car accident. And, um, that, that's it. And that's the end of Junkyard Dog. But when he was with WWF, he was on the Hogan's Rock and Wrestling cartoon. They made LJN figures of him. They made the thumb wrestling figures of him. And in fact, um, the first thumb wrestling figures I had were Junkyard Dog and Nikolai Volkov. And JYD's finisher was called the Thump, and it was basically like a running power slam. But the way these figures were set up, like, it was perfect for the Thump. And I used to have JYD thump Cole off all the time because it just looked good. And we got hammers running around out here now. But um, anyway, so if you are a fan of Junkyard Dog, you definitely need to read this book. If you um, are a fan of Mid-South Wrestling, this book will bring back so many memories and... Um, tell you a bunch of stuff that you might not have known before. Um, and that's about it. Like, if you're a fan of Bill Watts, you might want to read this book, you know? Um, I feel like the author did a good job at showing how much love there was for JYD. But I just don't feel like there was enough information to put a whole book together. So it's a it's a good read. Um, give it a gander. And um, if you've read it already, let me know what you think down below. And um, yeah.